This tutorial is going to start discussing the way different modes propagate in slab waveguides and specifically their velocity. And in the initial discussion about this, you come up with a paradox if you would analyze this problem in terms of rays and then in terms of waves. Let's draw the two edges of a slab waveguide and let's consider two different waves that might propagate down the waveguide. One would have a k vector which is nearly axial, so something propagating at an angle very close to grazing incidence to the wall, close to 90 degrees. And we'll label that beam A. We can consider another mode where the k vector angle with the waveguide is much steeper. This is a little bit exaggerated, but the idea is that this would be close to the critical angle where the refraction would be at 90 degrees, just barely guided by the waveguide. So this would be another possible beam, and that's beam B. And certainly in this case, if you asked which one of these rays is going to get out of the waveguide first, if the waveguide has some total length L, we would form the expectation that the A beam would get out first. Or another way to express that would be to say that the time T for beam A to be inside the waveguide would be less for the same length of waveguide than time TB. Now we can also go to a wave picture and in the wave picture if we want to talk about the characteristic plane wave direction that was represented by this k vector here I could draw that same vector A and then draw a bunch, I'll draw five planes along the representing five wave fronts here. And then I can do the same thing for the second beam, where I'm going at a much steeper angle. And with the same wavefront spacing, approximately, here are those five wavefronts. We're talking about vertical motion down the waveguide in terms of what dictates which wave gets out faster. So if I were to mark a certain point on this wave frontier and then look at how that advances, I know that this point down below is exactly one cycle ahead of it. And then in the next time point ahead, this would be the advance down the waveguide of that front with a slight tilt. And if I follow the same idea, here I'll start at about the same height and consider a point here and look at the advance here, one, two, three, you can already see that four is going to be down here and five is down here. Much faster phase advance in this direction than in this direction. We can be pretty mathematical about that in our language here, which is what tutorials are good for, is for pausing and doing language. These two k vectors have the same value because they're both propagating inside of the same material. The wave numbers are the same, so the w but the y component of the a beams Kay is the y component of this beam. Almost the entire wave vector is directed in the downward y direction. So Kay, in the, the absolute value of Kay, granted it's pointing downwards, but Kay is much greater than the y component of this beam. Let's remember what the total electric field is of the standing wave pattern inside of a waveguide. The electric field, and I'm going to write this conceptually here, the electric field of the crossed plane waves going this way and the opposite way to create a standing wave in X and a traveling wave in Y, that electric field we have written as some magnitude and then the X dependence of this field is cosine of KX X plus some arbitrary phase shift that we don't care about right now, times a traveling wave expression in Y and T, KY, Y, minus omega T. So you can see that this term here really does say that the more that the plane waves that constitute this interference pattern are directed downwards, the larger the k value will be 
and the larger the k value up here, the larger this k value, we can see that the phase velocity, the rate of drift downwards in phase of this downward traveling component of the field, that's going to be omega over ky. And it really is true that the phase advance of this wave downward, since it has a larger k, and k is in the denominator, it has a smaller phase advance. The more tilted the two waves are that create the standing wave pattern, like this more extreme ray creating a more tilted pair of rays, that's going to have a faster phase advance. So there's our paradox. In this case, we would expect now that TA is greater than TB. It takes a longer time for the standing wave pattern created by an interference of this beam and a tilted beam going in the mirror image direction. It takes a longer time for that standing wave pattern to drift down the waveguide to get out. And it would actually be the interference between these two more highly angled beams. Its standing wave pattern would drift down faster. So TB would be the smaller time. Here we expected TB to be the larger time. How do we get out of this paradox? And the answer is we go to an improved ray picture. As you might have expected, the rays are the approximation in this case. And that simple, that simple ray picture that we have up above isn't sufficient for understanding how fast the wave mode travels. And this is an interesting effect. And let's just take a second to appreciate that. Don't forget that any ray or any plane wave, more precisely, any plane wave as totally internally reflects, suffers a phase shift. And in the ray picture of what that phase shift means, we haven't really talked about it much, it is that the beam comes along to the interface and then spends a certain amount of time in that second forbidden region and then comes out again. So if some of this ability to drift downward is spent in this region, don't take this angled path too literally. That, that's just a way of looking like a, a ray doing a bounce. The ray travels downward while it's in this region. And so some of its downward drift is time spent in the N2 region. If we call N2 the refractive index of the cladding. And remember that N2 is smaller than N1. N1 is the core of the waveguide, N2 is the cladding. And so it sort of makes sense that if some of that downward drift is accomplished in a lower refractive index medium, that that higher angled ray might actually in some sense travel faster. It's got a longer geometric path that the ray traces out, but, in, but it might be that by traveling faster here, it actually gets out sooner. This is a real effect, and there's a name for it. It's called the the Gauss Henschen effect. Let me show you a couple of animations from a good website about this. This website here shows a beam of light, not just a plane wave, but a, a more collimated beam of light approaching this interface. And at the interface, if you can sort of see it in the uh, frame capture here, you've got a drift of energy going to the right. This is similar to the animations you've seen in class where I've had plane waves uh, ref reflecting at total internal reflection angles and in the forbidden zone you see just a downward drift of energy. Well here's a beam, a collimated beam coming into an interface drifting downward and coming back out again. That gives you some feeling for the idea that the ray actually goes in, makes a turn and then comes back out again. A better part of this website it has another little animation. Here's an animation of the that same sort of path of a beam coming into an interface and reflecting off the interface, but it's got two different scenarios drawn. Here is the true path of the beam, we, including this, this shift effect. They've solved the uh, Maxwell's equations rigorously. Here the person has subtracted off the reflection phase shift artificially, as if there were no phase shift. And do you see that when we let the actual phase shift happen, the beam moves a little bit to the right. That reflected beam moves a little bit to the right as if the beam, as if the light actually traveled a little bit inside of this air region. So those are two pictorial examples of the Goose Hansen, Henschen shift. And they suggest the idea that the more highly angled beams 
don't actually experience simply N1. They experience some combination of N1 and N2, and that allows them to speed up. So let's consider some limits of this case by drawing an index circle. We draw an index circle for refractive index N1 and refractive index N2. So here would be my circle for N2, and then outside of that, I'll draw a larger circle for N1 since the core has a higher refractive index than the cladding. Okay, so that's my larger N1. Here's my smaller N2. If I draw my A beam, that angle was almost straight downwards. And the Y component of this beam is very nearly the equivalent of a K vector pointing straight down. So if I were to figure out the velocity there, right, the phase velocity is omega over KY. Omega over KAY component is approximately omega over K itself. Because it's almost straight down. Almost the entire K vector is pointed in the Y direction. So the Y component of the KA vector is approximately omega over KA. And that would be equal to the speed of light over refractive index N1. So it's sort of like we're saying this beam, the beam that's, ver that's glancing, is, is approximately experiencing refractive index N1. Whereas, if I think about the second more angled beam, it's hitting the waveguide at almost the critical angle, just a little bit beyond the critical angle. And in the limit where it's really close to the critical angle, the geometry of the picture is that KAY It's making quite an angle now with the downward direction, so Ka's y component is not equal to k. It's almost equal to this height here, to, e, to q. So it's approximately equal to omega over q, which in terms of speed is going to be c over n2. What that's saying geometrically is that in the limit, taking this Gus Henschen, Henschen picture to its extreme, it's like the beam goes into this region, and since there's such a large penetration depth into that region at the critical angle, it spends a long distance in N2 before coming out again. And since it does that, we get an effective refractive index when theta is approximately at the critical angle. When theta 1 is approximately the critical angle, we're experiencing almost entirely the cladding's refractive index. And when we're heading almost straight down the axis of the waveguide, that occurs when theta 1 is approximately pi over 2, or 90 degrees. We can note that this beam here, that's the lowest order mode of a waveguide, m equals 0. This is the highest order mode of the waveguide, highest m. So now there really is no paradox. The, a careful treatment of interpreting the ray picture allows us to recover the effect that we saw already mathematically with the wave picture, which is that the more the two crisscrossing plane waves are angled with respect to the walls, the closer they are to the critical angle, it's actually the faster that that standing wave pattern drifts down the core of the waveguide. And at the extremes, you will actually experience just the cladding refractive index versus just the core index. In the next tutorial, we will then quantitatively discuss the speeds with which these two modes propagate down the waveguides, and most importantly, the difference in their arrival times when they come out of a fiber.